Great. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rebecca Goslin, and I am currently the Director of Clinical Initiatives with Colorado Association for School-Based Health Centers. I am a licensed professional counselor by training, um, and I really want to frame that a lot of the work that I'm going to be presenting on today started when I was working as a behavioral health provider at a school-based health center uh, located in southwestern Colorado. Uh, CASIC, where I work now, is largely um, centered in Denver and supports the 69 school-based health centers throughout Colorado. Um, I hold up our rural representation um, and continue to live in southwestern Colorado. Um, so as we get started, uh, a few things that I just want to um, talk about to frame our conversation, um, and that is the word collaborate. So the uh, very first time I put this presentation together, I looked up the definition of collaborate, and there were some that really struck me um, when I, I took the time to read them. So to collaborate, to work jointly with others and together, especially in an intellectual endeavor, is where I think most of us spend our time when we think about collaboration. And I wanted to point out, because as we start to collaborate with other partners, um, sometimes it can feel a little contentious. And this uh, second definition can come into play, which is to cooperate with or willingly assist an enemy of one's country, and especially an occupying force. So um, collaborate has some big roots, it has some big roles. Um, and then the, finally, where I hope we, we can get when we talk about collaboration with entities is to co cooperate with an agency or instrumentally with which one is not immediately connected. And this is where a lot of this work happens. School-based health centers um, across the nation have different structures around how they're organized and their relationship with schools. And school-based health centers are not schools and they're not educators. And so figuring out where school-based health center work fits in in the, the daily policy work and happenings on a school really is a cross-agency collaboration. Um, and that's where we're gonna focus a lot of this time. So as I go through this, I'd like to challenge you in your head to think, in your school that your SBHC serves, can you name five teachers that work there? Can you name three support or office staff in those buildings? Can you name two administrators? A board member? The superintendent? So think about, do you, who do you know in the school world? Because those are your point people. Um, and that's where you start to form collaborative relationships. A couple other key concepts. Um, you'll hear me talk about restorative justice, which is really about when something happens that has caused some kind of damage to a community, how can there be amends made? And often this really gets put in the hands of youth through mediation, peer-to-peer -peer interactions. It really focuses on that idea of resolving conflict. And this is a really big paradigm shift from most school discipline, which in the past has been more punishment oriented. This is instead of you did this thing, so here is your consequence. This is you did this thing, so here's how you can work on fixing that. So making amends is a huge part of that process and comes into alternative suspension, especially when you're talking to the school. So we'll get more into that. When we talk about an alternative to suspension, you'll also hear things such as alternative to discipline. This is more of a specific subset to that. And the whole point of this is to reduce the time that students spend out of school and, and really back in the classroom. So in school suspension, they're still on the school campus, but they're missing out on academic and social opportunities. Uh, so you want to have an opportunity to re-engage students rather than distance them. And within all of this, there's a trauma-informed approach. And that refers to a shift. It is really a culture shift that requires organizations, both the school 
and the healthcare providers to make this shift and understand a little bit about how toxic stress impacts things and also to create an environment that responds um, without triggering those systems when possible. And it really shifts how you interact with students. So those are the key concepts that I want you to have in mind as we go through uh, this concept of collaborating with schools and um, using that to find where the clinic and the school might have common ground. Uh, a few things to consider when you start to um, build these relationships is what are shared goals? What are things that school-based health center strives to do and the school strives to do that you can, can essentially make your pitch about? Um, so some shared goals end up being attendance, increasing students' ability to focus, and having family involvement along the way. Um, so when you start to look at programs that you want to propose, whether that's an alternative to suspension using SBIRT or something else, always noting how, how can I sell this so that we all meet our goals. Um, one way that you can look at this uh, through alternative to suspension is that it does increase attendance. When students are not suspended, they are present. Um, it also builds that trauma-informed approach saying we're not going to separate you and throw you back into a situation where you don't get support. We're going to bring support to you and keep you engaged. Another really important piece of this is allowing room for restorative justice. So an alternative suspension, a lot of resistance that schools and communities often feel is you're letting kids off the hook. Uh, they got into trouble and now they get to stay on campus. Um, so this is where restorative justice can really come into play. Yes, let them stay on campus and have them contribute something to make amends for the behavior that got them into the situation. That is in addition to expert as alternative to suspension. So this isn't necessarily just one piece. So it can be multiple pieces that come uh, into your proposal. Another part is that um, when you think about meeting common ground, expert allows you to address multiple needs. So um, by this point, you guys are probably very well acquainted with the multiple levels of expert screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. And what that does is it allows you to meet the student where they are and support change over time, which when you go back to the common goals of school means they're less likely to get into trouble repeatedly in the future. So instead of just saying you're uh, suspended for three days, you have the opportunity to say you're going to work with behavioral health provider for three weeks or three months. And that continued support leads to behavior change that allows them to focus better, to stay at school, and to succeed. Um, that increased focus is a really big part of it. When students aren't worried about getting in trouble and aren't navigating the discipline system, and they have the tools to regulate themselves, they can focus. So this is all about bringing in support. Um, an approach I really like to take on this is this is actually increasing expectations we have of students. We're not going to give you that easy out and say you get into trouble and you go home. We're going to say you made a decision, it impacted our school community, and it impacted your education. And now with that increased expectation that we want you here and sober, we're going to give you the support to get there. So you're really supporting students so that they can stay in school and focus. To do this, there are a lot of pieces to consider. Um, I'm going to leave this slide uh, up for you to read through, but the really big takeaway in this is as you go through these considerations, you want to consider them for all the stakeholders that this impacts. So you want to think about how do these things impact the students? How do they impact your school-based health center? How do they impact the school, parents, and community? 
community especially could be law enforcement. Um, and if you have an SRO on campus, how does that impact their role? Um, how does this affect kids on diversion? Um, so there are a lot of pieces all along the way. And it's not just how does, they, how does it impact them, but also what input might they have? So when you start to look at um, what are the limitations? Where do you have to draw lines? That's really important to know um, from the school standpoint, there are legal requirements that you, you have to follow. Um, so the school I worked at, when we started to look at expert is an alternative to suspension for substance use, the line was at use. If there was possession, that was a different issue. Um, and, and that's where we started. Um, so being really clear about that, but then you have to communicate that back to students and let them know this is where that line is. So this is an option if you're um, if you're under the influence at school, but if you're caught using on campus, that might be a different situation. Um, and so really being open in in how this is going to roll out, um, knowing that there are um, opportunities to hear how all of the stakeholders um, can build the program because then you have their buy-in. This is where you get into the details. So there is a lot here. Um, and when you start to think about that plan, again, you want it to be collaborative. So this impacts policy and procedure. Those in a school district take some time to change. This is not draft a memo and put it into um, effect. You have to go through school boards sometimes. Uh, that's usually for policy. For procedures, um, you need to have your administrative staff buy in. And you also need to have uh, teachers and student support staff who can enforce this as well. So to do that, you need to start with the purpose and make sure everybody's in. Start with buy in. Um, so the purpose when we uh, did alternative to suspension was keep students in school and provide connection to resources. We defined what the process was both for the school and for the clinic. So for school, this is going to look like referral. Documentation is a huge piece that I'll come back to in a bit. Um, and also, is there a restorative justice component that they want to add in addition to alternative to suspension? Where does that come into play? On the clinic side, you need to know what you do when you get these referrals and how you follow up that communication. So this is where really understanding who does what. Know the people involved and make sure that everybody's clear on that. For school staff, especially when you move away from administration and you move into other staff, Figuring out how administration communicates that to them, how they're trained and they have the tools they need to make that process happen. And then you implement it. And once you implement it, it's all about communication, making sure that you let all the stakeholders know this is the change that's going to happen and this is the process. This is how it looks. This is what you can expect on the school side. This is what you can expect on the clinic side. When we started to do this, a whole, whole issue that we had not anticipated that came up was students were afraid that if they went to the clinic in these circumstances, they'd be drug tested. So we had a lot of education to do to let them know that that wasn't the role of the school-based health center and that wasn't going to happen in these situations. Um, and we figured that out by listening, by, by understanding. We heard from parents and from teachers concern that kids were getting let off the hook. So a lot of education around um, why this model was done and how it holds students accountable. Um, and then we gave a clear timeline for how this was going to work and also for when we were going to come back and revise it. And we revised it about um, at the end of the first quarter um, of the school year where we implemented it. We revised it midway through the year, and then we revised it headed into the following school year. So there was a lot of opportunity to say, we're learning how to do this, and this is not a one-shot a one deal. 
So um, what this actually looked like on the ground, and this was done at Southwest Open School. This is a um, absolutely amazing charter school in Cortez, Colorado. They serve a very high risk population of students. Um, they're an alternative education campus with a pretty heavy focus on experiential education. Um, they are a very small school, which worked pretty, um, pretty well to our advantage. So um, that's all important to understand as far as this is a pretty non-traditional setting to start with which means implementing this process went through non-traditional um, processes as well. The school-based health center and the school already had a very close working relationship. And this was actually started because the school director at the time reached out to the clinic and said, we have a problem with kids showing up to campus under the influence of marijuana, and we need to address that, help us. So, um, so that was a very friendly context for initiating all this. Um, and it still took a lot of work of how are we going to do this? So we looked at what the school-based health center needs were because capacity is always an issue. School-based health centers are stretched thin and staff do a lot. So we looked at how can we support the school and, and what are we already doing that can support that? And how could this process help the clinic out? And then we looked at how we could support the school needs. This was the process identified. So what we came up with is um, if a student was suspected of being under the influence of a substance, they were directed to go to the school uh, administrative staff who immediately said, okay, that's it for today. We're gonna send you home, um, kind of like a sick day. So this is a health issue. Um, and then you're gonna come back tomorrow. And whenever appropriate, they scheduled a meeting with the student and the parent. Um, given some of the family context, that was not always the most appropriate move. Uh, but by and large, the, the meeting the next day was with the parent and the student. And it was at that point that the school administrator would say, you have options. The option for suspension is there, or you can have an option to choose this alternative to suspension. That involved a referral to the school-based health center, usually same day access. And at that point, the school-based health center would do ESPER. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention is the day the student um, was suspected of being under the influence before they went home, the school would ask them to go to the clinic to have their vitals checked. Most often, students did not agree to do this. Um, and we found that this was a very, very important part of the process for school um, liability, that if they're saying, we think there's a health concern and we think someone's under the influence, we're not just sending them off of campus, we're getting a vital check first. And they have every right to decline it. We can't force them to do it, but the school offered it and documented if the student accepted it or not. Um, and they also communicated to the parent whether it was accepted or not. Um, so then if the student chose to do alternative to suspension, they would meet with the behavioral health provider um, after completing a craft. And then the brief intervention would occur that day. And then it was really up to the discretion of the behavioral health provider on what is going to support the student's needs. Um, most often, students were also given a PHQ-9 depression screening and a GAD-7 anxiety screening. And I would say the majority of the follow-ups done were around underlying concerns that um, the substance use was on top of. Um, the behavioral health provider would also make sure that they communicated to the student to make this process work. I need a release of information to talk to the school. Again, the students in control there of whether or not they're going to say yes or no. Um, and, and I was always clear as the behavioral health provider saying, I'm not going to tell them what we talk about. I'm just going to say, yes, you're completing this or no, you're not. Um, and then you communicate back to the school, we have a plan, they're gonna meet with me four times, I'll let you know when they're done. So that was the process in a nutshell. Um, some of the challenges were initial staff buy-in, especially around confronting students when they felt like they might be under the influence. 
Um, administrative changes at the school certainly impacted uh, the rollout of this program. That communication piece, making sure releases of information were in place and that the consent to come to the clinic got signed. Um, and then also uh, clarifying to students what it was when you came to the clinic. The major successes within one year of this project, the school saw a massive decrease in student intoxication on campus um, with fewer suspensions. They also had um, staff more confident and more bought into the process of addressing that use when it occurred. In general, it supported an ongoing shift that was far beyond this effort, um, but it supported a trauma-informed campus. And then it really allowed conversations of using SPERT beyond substance use. So as I said, a lot of it was saying, okay, you come back after lunch um, and you've used marijuana at lunch, what's going on there? Or use it before English every day. Um, and it turns out, you know, there's somebody in that class that's really anxiety provoking, or they're really struggling in math and they need some extra support. Um, and so we were able to say that SBIRT is a part of this, um, and it, it, it goes beyond just the substance use issue. And that allowed students to have the tools to not use during the school day. Um, one challenge I didn't mention, but I will before we wrap up, is that um, collecting data proved extremely difficult for this project. Um, getting the school discipline data was really hard to track, especially um, with three different directors at the school over the course of this project and different requirements for how they reported discipline. Um, and then tracking it um, on the school-based health center side was also difficult because we couldn't build directly uh, to say this was expert. So um, data itself was, was hard to come by and um, a lot of questions I get are did students decrease use um, and, and we really couldn't measure that well. We know they came to school under the influence less, uh, less often. Um, whether or not they decreased use outside of that was a lot harder to have the data to show. So I will in there.